Uh, my fear is that the is less the repercussions of the war against Iraq, but the fact that it's happening in the framework of his doctrine of asserting the right to make a preemptive strike and impose regime change wherever it wishes, wherever it wants to. Now, you and I may favor regime change in Iraq, but Kissinger was in the business of regime change, and if Bush has established this. If, if Bush establishes the precedent of being able to do this at will in Iraq, are we not worried about where he's going to do it next? What about Brazil, for example, where uh, you know a government has taken power much disliked in Washington? It well, doesn't I, worry you? Yeah, that's a very good uh, counterposition, but I think you'll see at once that um, between uh, moving into Chile, um, overthrowing a government that has a constitution and that does have elections and murdering its elected president and moving into Iraq and sponsoring uh, political parties and elections and destroying a dictatorship, there is a difference and not just a factual one or a practical one but also a moral one. In the northern provinces of Iraq, the, the provinces that are under, currently under American protection that I mentioned before, there are, to my knowledge, 21 newspapers, uh, several political parties. A friend of mine, Dr. Baram Salih, a very fine guy, has just been elected the Prime Minister of, uh, of, of that part of Kurdistan. Uh, this means that we're not, we're not just bluffing or fantasizing or being utopian when we say that we have some achievements to point to. In the meanwhile, in Bahrain, um, in Qatar, um, and to some extent in Kuwait, elections are being held, women are being allowed to vote in them and run in them. Uh, where, the, where it can be discovered, which, where the pressure for this comes from, it's the United States supporting this process, not opposing it. And as for the, the, the old cases of the banana republics in South America, I think you can see from the Inspector Clouseau-like performance of the Bush administration over the Chavez coup that never was, that the, the, the will to act in that way um, in, what, in, the, in the countries that now constitute the OAS has simply evaporated. There will not be a return to government by coup um, in South America. And if, and if there is, I would just, well, what was I talking about when I said Chavez, big boy? <laughs> Colombia. And look, look at Argentina. It's had no government for nearly a year now. It barely has a pulse. It has a, hardly has a currency. Does the army want it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. The army doesn't want it. They, they say we have to leave this to civil society, or maybe they're just cynical and say we don't want the responsibility. No, but the era of the military banana republic regime in, in Latin America is, in my judgment, over. There's only one military regime now in the region, which is Cuba. There's, there's only one regime in the area that is run by men in uniform, and it's in Havana. And that, of that one, I think probably the United States wouldn't mind a regime change. Well, but that's an old story. In, in the 1980s, Not a very creditable one, alas. In, in the 1980s, Wolfowitz and Pearl were calling for a U.S. Uh, military invasion of, of Cuba. And you don't have any fear that... No one's well, calling for it now. It's not even on the axis of evil. Um, but Cuba might is, it be promoted Occasionally, there. people like John Bolton remember to insult uh, Fidel, the maximum leader. But the fact of the matter is, as everyone in this room knows, one way or another, the thing has run so far out of steam uh, that everyone's just waiting for it to end in its own way, and there's no need for a fight over it. And that's the situation. Um, Sad in a way, because the Cuban Revolution once meant a good deal uh, to the people of Cuba and to the, and to the neighboring countries too. And it's uh, one says this with some regret, but it has to be faced. But no, there was not going to be a return to the Golpe and the Caudillo. In South America, and we would know by now if there was going to be. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you one final question about the Iraq War, and then I think it's probably time to open up the mics on the floor. Um, and my final question is this Imagine that you are Osama bin Laden, you're sitting in your cave uh, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, or maybe in your luxury apartment in Lahore or maybe in the basement of a mosque in Saudi Arabia, we don't know, wherever you are, you're thinking, what's going to be my best recruiting tool? Would not a U.S. invasion of Iraq be at the top of your list? Um, I can't think where, why he thinks 
I mean, I'm interested that you, you pick this because implied in this is the idea that Mr. Bin Laden uh, takes the Iraqi side or the Saddam Hussein side in this dispute. Um, and that is indeed implied or suggested in his own broadcasts. He refers to an attack on Iraq as being an attack on the Muslim world, right? as if the Kurds were not Muslims, for example. They're Sunni Muslim, as if Ahmed Chalabi wasn't a Muslim. He's Shia Muslim, as if any replacement government in Iraq wouldn't be Muslim, as if the Northern Alliance isn't Muslim. This is, these are the ways in which Mr. Bin Laden shows to us that he's blinded by his own fatuous limited, primitive ideology. It's this that's done us the great favor. It seems to me that if things had gone on as they were uh, before the 11th of September, the year before last, last year, excuse me, there was a v every chance that the Talibanization of Pakistan, a process that was well underway, would have been completed. Within the Pakistani secret police and army, there was a, a strong process of Talibanization to which the United States government was practically indifferent was about to take over the Pakistani state with its nuclear weapons. And it was drawing with complete complacency on support from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. This movement was gaining ground everywhere. Mr. Bin Laden completely ruined the plan because for him it's not enough to be a fundamentalist or a fanatic. For him there must be a grand opera. There must be the real gesture of propaganda by deed and martyrdom and sacrifice. And he has uh, made it certain he has made it certain that um, for as long as he's willing to uh, keep on trying it, his network will be broken and broken again, and he will have to hide his face. He will have to admit, as he has already had to, that he, he left behind the people of Afghanistan with his Taliban friends. They fled under cover of night, the people who they tortured and oppressed. They did not meet the infidel in battle, but they ran away. They hide now in holes, and they, they can hear from us at any time they want. You wish martyrdom, we are here to help. Let me add one more thing about Mr. Bin Laden, because I'm, sh I'm really shocked how little attention it's got. If it's true, as it seems to be, that this statement is originally from him, I hope you noticed his justification for the uh, mass murder of tourists in Bali, in uh, Indonesia. Did you? He said, Australians have to be punished because of the role of Australia in assisting the independence of East Timor. Now, what the Australians did was little enough to supervise the evacuation of Indian troops from East Timor and the eventual independence of the territory, but it was Australia's responsibility under the UN. And Mr. Bin Laden now says this, is, this means we must kill Australians wherever we find them because they have separated a Christian people from Muslim Indonesia. If you want it, if you want it put any more plainly than that, what you're looking at, that you're staring right down uh, the gun barrel of fascism. Um, I don't know if there's any plane away. Okay. So. Um, I'd like to lay down just a few rules for the question period. Uh, first of all, if you'd like to ask a question, I think there's two mics. You can line up at the mics and we can go back and forth. Um, we're going to let our Young Activist Award winners ask the first questions if they want to. Do you want to? Okay, so Harmony and Genevieve, could you go uh, Second thing is, please actually ask a question. It's like Jeopardy. So, uh, you know, you can turn any statement into a question. But you have to do that so that Christopher or Adam can respond to it. And um, finally, we'd like to give as many people an opportunity to speak as possible. So uh, you'll have about a minute to make your point. And when there are 15 seconds less left, I'll hit my high-tech timer. OK? So. So again, my name is Harmony. I wanted to ask, um, I do want to put out a statement, right? And then ask a question that results from it. I think she's already made a statement. Oh, it's just a quick, it's a quick point, right? Because. She's already had yeah. a lot of time at the mic. It's OK. I want to raise the question. I don't know what's happening. I think happened. we're, are you standing? I don't know. Is that OK? It is the question. To me, the question is the question of imperialism. And it's not a question of, is this an abstract left analysis on the question of imperialism? 
The people who are in power right now have been very explicit in the newspaper, in their plans, that they're trying to build an American empire. And I hear what you're saying, and you have a lot of factual information to back up what you're saying, but I want to hear how you can justify any kind of U.S. In intervention when they're very explicit that what their agenda is, is to build an American empire. Okay. Well, um, here's the situation. Um, the United States has been attacked itself uh, on its own soil by an internationally coordinated uh, movement, uh, which is also attacking in different forms innumerable other societies um, from, well, not innumerable, numerable, numerous, from Nigeria to Indonesia. Um, the way I would phrase it would be this. There's a civil war going on in the Muslim world. It's been going on for some time. Uh, the, uh, the side that uh, wants to impose the Sharia, the absolutist, theocratic form of Islam, has not much chance of winning this war, but it's a war on a very, very big front. It wants to win it uh, by bringing the war to the United States and to European societies, which means we can't be neutral in the war, which is a war that goes on on rather a large front, in fact, is global. Thus, yes, there will have to be for a very long time a globalized sense of engagement and commitment to make sure that our Muslim allies, who also don't want to live under Sharia theocracy, do not lose this international civil war. Um, if some overambitious neoconservative types choose to call this an imperial responsibility on the part of the United States, I don't think that they um, very much overstate it. I wish they would find a better word um, or a more elegant term for it. But, the, but the, the, the brute facts of the situation are as I have described them, unless anyone can find a way of evading uh, this challenge or, or this responsibility. And I don't find, as I go around talking about this, that anybody can. So glib talk about imperialism gets you nowhere. Well, it gets animal noises out of some people. But if they could hear themselves doing it, they wouldn't, believe you me.